Hi, Kim. Hi, how are you? Good, Good how are you? Just gonna get you a little bit bigger. Thank you so much. Um, so like John said, Kim works at Penguin Random House and I got to interview her for part of my capstone project and I'm just so happy that we have you here for the conference. I was really, really excited that you could join us today. Well, I am so honored to be here and it's really a pleasure to connect with you again, Tina. So That's, thanks for absolutely. having me. Yeah, absolutely. So I just, we have a couple of questions that we're gonna go through and, and possibly discuss and you are gonna share some slides if you would like. And then the last 15 minutes, we're gonna open it up for questions. So sure. awesome, let's go ahead and get started. So again, this is Kim Sharif. She's the Executive Vice President, Director of Strategy for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion at Penguin Random House. Kim, can you tell us uh, your pathway to publishing and a bit about your current position at Penguin Random House? Absolutely. First, I want to start by saying that um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. And I'm here at my home where I live with my family. We're on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. But this land was originally stewarded by the Lenape and Wappinger people. Um, and I'm proud to walk in their footsteps. So who am I and how did I make my way to publishing? <laughs> Um, my family, and I mean my immediate family, but also um, my mother and my father and my ancestors, um, all were just incredible readers. Um, books were lining the walls of my home from the time I was born. Um, so I've always had this incredible reverence for the written word and its power. But I come to Penguin Random House with virtually no publishing experience. Um, and I say that loud and proud because I think that's a part of our evolution when it comes to thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion in this industry. Um, so maybe you can say I'm a strategist and an artist in a lawyer's body. Mm -hmm. uh, all kinds of things wrapped up into one. I've had a career that I've felt so grateful for. I started off at a few law firms and did some kind of unorthodox things there. Um, worked in corporate finance, energy, did some legislative law, just very interesting. I actually started off right there in Washington, D.C., uh, but then I, um, I went on to go to a small law firm that seconded me in-house to Black Entertainment Television, again there when the headquarters were in, um, in the D.C. area. That was really interesting because not only was my role novel, but um, the entire mission of the organization was to elevate and highlight voices that did not have typical access to center stage in their industry. Um, and so that was just really thrilling for me, right? That the entire mission of the organization was focused on that. Um, I got to help with the Viacom merger, uh, but then ultimately left and went to Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts. It always had my sights set on working in the nonprofit industry because mission-based work really meant a lot to me. So while I was lucky to work at a for-profit entity that had a real mission, um, this was really my goal in a way. Um, so there I was in a newly created role of deputy general counsel. And so my focus was on law, but I was able to just expand my horizons um, and do some things that really were important to me in conjunction with the time when that entire campus was being redeveloped. I don't know if you know, if any of you remember this, but it was a billion dollar project and we were literally tearing down travertine off of the sides of the buildings and putting in glass, right? As a way to physically create access to the space. But behind the scenes, I was working on creating access for audiences, audiences that we hadn't normally seen there, um, making it more accessible, making it more comfortable, more welcoming. Um, after I left Lincoln Center, I was a consultant. I went right back literally the next week and I worked on a program creating access for families, families of all socioeconomic backgrounds, um, ethnic, racial backgrounds as well. Um, again, really where my heart was. And then that led me to American Valley Theater. 
um, sticking with the nonprofit performing arts, but again, really, really looking to open up this art form that was historically very homogeneous um, to dancers of all backgrounds. Um, and so while there, my first entree into the publishing industry came to fruition because we negotiated an eight book children's book deal with Random House Children's Books. And from the time I walked into the lobby of Penguin Random House, <laughs> I just knew that it felt like home. Um, I didn't know what the feeling meant at the time, but um, in hindsight, I realized that I was really home. You know, I was in a place where this powerful vehicle of the written word could do the things that I was doing all along, right? Even when it wasn't my main uh, job description, I was always doing this work, you know, this DEI work, even when it wasn't called that in the organizations where I found myself. Um, and so by virtue of having worked on this deal, I learned of this position and, um, and the rest is history. That's great that I, I love hearing that journey about how you came to be at Penguin Random House. Um, I, that's, that's wonderful. And I'm, I'm really, really happy that you um, kind of mentioned that you actually, that you don't have a lot of experience in, in publishing uh, because as you say, it is, I believe that is a really important aspect of the conversation of diversity. Um, so go, moving forward, can you tell us about the current DEI initiatives at Penguin Random House? Can you describe the process for determining what steps you wanted to take or, or what direction you wanted to follow? Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I'm going to say that when I first opened the door to the work that Penguin Random House had done, I was extremely impressed. Um, Penguin Random House had come a really long way in a way that actually none of the other organizations I had worked with had come. Um, the commitment that was made was so clear um, and there was so much support for it that frankly, that was unusual. And I felt like I was coming to the right place. That was a lot of the appeal um, for, for joining Penguin Random House was that I could see very clearly that the commitment was there. So what I did was, you know, in addition to kind of figuring out where the organization was in their DEI journey at the time, um, you know, I always like to understand that status quo in order to then move to what I call the inclusion first strategy, right? I wanted to make sure that the house was ready, right? I think that sometimes even in the acronym, diversity, equity, and inclusion, we tend to focus on increasing our diversity first. Whereas I really believe that we do have to be ready to receive that diversity and then you know, prepare for everyone that comes, right? So that they can all thrive and feel comfortable and feel like they're in the right place for them. But that also allows the organization to extract the wonderful and deep value that there is in diversity. Um, and so that was what I tried to focus on first was how ready are we? Um, and so I talked to people. Um, you know, our mission is to ignite a universal passion for reading by creating books for everyone. Right. If that isn't a moral and ethical imperative, I don't know what is, right? Because if we think about the power of the written word, and then we think about the notion of creating books for everyone in order to ignite a passion, right? In order to transfer knowledge, um, you have to be on a solid um, ethical and moral foundation in order to, to do this in a way that will reach everyone. Um, and so, I tried to think of how do we prepare ourselves as a workforce to do this? Um, and so, you know, I'll, I'll stop there because I don't want to ramble on for too long just <laughs> to say that that was the way that I entered this endeavor um, was to, to listen first and then consider um, based on where we were, what we needed to do next in order to, to create those conditions and allow us to truly fulfill and live into that mission. 
That's great. So you, you've described your approach a little bit already. Um, can you tell us a little bit, do you have any specific goals for Penguin Random House, such as is there a specific metric you'd like to hit or a, a specific number or a goal that, you wanting, that you're wanting to reach? Yeah, well, there are a lot of them. And you know, <laughs> Tina, if you've seen the strategic plan, but let me, you know, what I really need to do is um, pay homage to what came before, right? Um, and every organization needs to just enter this work wherever they are, right? There's no right place. There's no wrong place. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I do have some slides, but I feel like I'm just enjoying <laughs> <laughs> talking, maybe I'll pull something up later, but sure, sure. Um, I'm enjoying, you know, having an exchange with you, but basically the trajectory for Penguin Random House was this upward swing. You know, we started in 2016 just by saying, look, this is important work, right? And then all the way through now to 2022, I have a timeline and it's literally like this, you know, rising to the heavens with more and more commitment and work focused on this area. Um, and so I would say, you know, the solid foundation was built. And when I came in, I was thinking, okay, how do we codify all these things that we, we show that we believe in, right? And that we're working off of based on the activity that's happening. And so I crowdsourced what we called our DEI value statement. And you know what, I actually will pull this up. I'll pull up um, a slide that shows our value statement. Give me one second, everyone, please. Uh, let's see. Okay. I'm not seeing, okay, good. Oh, I can even see that it's up there. So everyone can see this, correct? Yep. Okay. Yep, we so, this is actually the juxtaposition of our mission along with the guiding principles that are in our value statement. Um, we are focusing our work on equitable practices, unbiased support, open communication, and perseverance, right? So to be able to just focus on the elements that we need to continue to do this work and progress um, I thought was an important way to start. So that's what we did. And I will actually show you, um, I'll show you the, maybe I will. Okay, there we are. So this is the, the value statement itself. And you'll see it's very involved, right? And then over here, we have those four principles, but there's a lot of background, right? There's a lot of context that needed to be set we needed to talk about from whence we came, right? And where we want to go and how we feel as an organization um, and, and what we think is pertinent for us to continue to progress. So this was a really, really interesting exercise um, that I hope is creating some glue for this work for everyone and also creating accessibility, right? Even if people aren't concertedly involved in leadership positions, doing DEI work day in, day out, this can guide their path. Um, and so I hope that it is. In fact, Tina, I'll ask you, you know, do you find that people, and I'm gonna take this down now, um, do you find that people around PRH have um, found any value in the value statement? <laughs> Uh, personally, I, I really do. I, I think it's I think it's an important thing to have. And I, I know I touch upon this in, in my capstone project in my presentation, but I I think it's just an important thing to have it down in words and to kind of have that just you know, something specific and written down. And I believe it's kind of like helped us start to realize the goals and kind of start to realize which direction we want to go. So personally, I, I do think that, I mean, that's my personal opinion, but from what I have gathered from my coworkers and colleagues is that it's very valuable. Excellent. And, you know, we're really just at the tip of the iceberg with it too. We just Absolutely. issued it in the spring. And so I hope it will become more and more, and I will mention it, you know, in a few of the other things. Um, that we accomplished this year. And these are basically, I'm focusing on things that have happened in the last 10 months or so, mm -hmm. right, January. Um, in conjunction with the value statement, we also created what we call the DEI feedback forum. 
And it's basically just, you know, a, a Google form, right, that people can fill out either anonymously or they can provide their content information and ask any question, make any comment. Um, it was meant at first to collect feedback on the value statement, um, but it is an open forum. So we get comments, questions on all manner of things. Um, and it's, it's really wonderful. And in fact, we got some comments at the beginning of the process that said, thank you so much for allowing us to give you feedback and, and asking feedback, asking for feedback, because I was very serious to say, like, I really am, I really, really do want feedback. And I'm not kidding here, <laughs> you know, <laughs> please do. And I think even that was helpful for the community. And it allowed people, as I said, who are at various places in this DEI journey um, to raise their voices, right? Um, and so that has been an ongoing effort that I think is creating some, you know, psychological safety for people, right? A place where they can say something and not necessarily um, fear, right? What's gonna come back to them, right, in return. And then we can start to talk through these issues as a community as well. Um, so speaking of community, and Tina will know this well, we embarked <laughs> this you know, spring summer on a journey which we've never taken before. And that is to have DEI training for our entire workforce, all 5,000 of us. Now, Penguin Random House has a, just an amazing series of trainings and other experiences that delve into the DEI realm, right, Tina? I mean, it's like the learning and development department, are, they're incredible. You can Absolutely. go on to our PeopleNet system, right? And you can find just about anything that you want. We have access to LinkedIn Learning. We have all these different things. Um, but we never asked everyone to engage in the same learning experience, right? So that one of my big goals was to help us all have a common language around this work. Um, and so the name of the learning experience is moving toward equity. So Penguin Random House, moving toward equity. Um, and hmm, I'm gonna actually bring up another slide here. Sorry, I know this is a little bit clunky and I no, think no, it's, it's, it's allowing me to still participate in my virtual form. Yes, please, um, please. No, it's fine. Let me bring up, I'm just going to bring up a quick, let's see, can everyone see that? Okay, I see it up myself too. Yep. So this is just a one pager that shows you the different elements of this you know, learning experience, right? I like to think of it as an experience because we're not just having people um, go into a room or hop onto a screen and receive knowledge, right? Which is a, a wonderful way, right? To increase your knowledge. However, um, particularly with DEI work, I think that you also have to experience it. Right? It's so personal to all of us. It deals with our identities. It deals with the way we interact with one another. Um, it deals with our perspective and our outlook on the world and on our work. Um, and so we started with a town hall where we just talked about what we were trying to do and talked about our community and what they had asked for in the past and the experiences that they had had in this realm. Um, and we invited our training partners, mm -hmm. the consultants that helped us design the program so that the community could also meet them, right? These were the faces that they were going to see um, throughout the series. And so we wanted them to understand who they were as people as well. And then we moved on to asking our community to take three core modules and they were self-guided. You know, you could do them at any time that you wanted to. We Tried to have everyone start at that mid-June uh, point and then, you know, try to have everyone done by mid-September. Right now, we are at about a 90% um, engagement rate, which I'm told is just unheard of, right? That we haven't ever done anything at the organization where 90% of us have actually engaged in the same thing. Um, so I'm so grateful to all my colleagues for drumming up 
um, participation. Tina, I'm, I know I owe you a thank you too. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's just, it's been this community effort. Um, and as you'll see there, you know, the modules had different focus. We did foundational concepts. Then we started to talk about how we have fluency around conversations involving race. We entered this, this you know, endeavor through the lens of race, just because it's such a focal point in our society. And it had been a focal point at Penguin Random House. Um, but then we moved on to learning about what's called or what we called an equity in action tool, um, which corresponds with the, the name of this session, um, because we wanted to look at equity first through the lens of race, but in a way that spans any identity, right? Assuring that there's equity for all this kind of, you know, inclusion first perspective that I was talking about earlier. Um, then we also created a manager module. Our people managers had been asking for just more information, more support about how they could lead these convert types of conversations in their teams um, and how to be an inclusive leader. So we created a specific module for that. And then I'll take you to number three, which is the kind of second phase of our learning experience. And that is to take what we learned in these modules, either three or four, and actually apply it. And this is why I say it's an experience, right? We're asking you to process the knowledge that you received and then apply it actually to your day-to-day. -day. So um, Tina, I don't know what you've heard about it in your division, et cetera, but um, we're about to kick off these conversations. Our facilitators, the people who will facilitate these conversations are in the process of training and preparing themselves. We had a separate session for that, as you'll see in that column too as well. Um, and a lot of materials that were provided to our facilitators to make sure that they feel as comfortable as possible going into an imperfect process, right? I mean, no matter how you slice it, to have conversations around race and other aspects of our identity, um, we have to be flexible, we have to be open. Um, and we have to know that there is no right or wrong, there is no perfect. Um, and we are basically building a muscle. Um, so we're getting them as ready as they can be to have this first conversation, which leads me to accountability and sustainability. So out of these conversations, we're asking teams to identify a practice, a procedure, a process that they want to look at in the present, right? So we're going to have them, and this is through the tool, like what's present? Is there something that's happening now that isn't optimal in terms of equity, right? And then think about what's possible, right? How we move toward equity with this practice, procedure, or process. Um, and that will be communicated in a divisional context. Um, it will be communicated to our divisional DEI officers. Um, and then we'll do this this analysis using this equity in action tool year after year after year until if I have my druthers, we don't need a tool at all, right? This consideration of equity, this interrogation of our processes, this interrogation of how we do things and how we interface with one another will just become a part of our DNA. So it's what I like to call DEI in the DNA, right? And to me, that, that is the goal. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing again. So I'm also looking at the time. My goodness, time flies. Time flies. Right, <laughs> right. Well, I mean, thank you so much. And I, I just want to, I'm so happy that you brought up the training modules because as an employee who has taken all three of them, I can attest that they are just wonderful. I, they are concise and thoughtful and educational and just a really great tool in moving towards a more diverse and inclusive workforce. I really, really think they're they're just great. Oh, thank you, Tina. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and ask one more question before we open it up to the audience for questions. Um, you, you've just, I, I think we've just been having such a great conversation. I love how in depth you go into these and there it's, it's just really, really, really great. Um, so 
what what is there anything you can suggest in your opinion that like publishing professionals like across the board like say individually can do to help foster a sense of inclusion in the industry like uh, as an individual aside from as as you've already mentioned ensuring a sense of psychological mm -hmm. safety being welcoming taking the training modules is there anything else you could think of that maybe people could do to work towards this yeah i mean it actually seems deceptively simple i think <laughs> um but it's, you know, just, there are innumerable challenges to it, right? Um, it's really appreciating the value of diverse stories, recognizing worth and the depth and the breadth of these stories that may not be the ones that you hear consistently, right? Um, and then listening, to those and making space for authentic voices as optimal ways to tell and create and amplify and disseminate these stories. And I'm not just talking about the content that we publish, right? I'm also talking about amongst our peers and colleagues, right? Because I think that that's where it begins. So even learning each other's stories will drive our work. Um, just as much, I will argue, as connecting with authors in the communities that we serve. Um, and so, you know, if I could give a, you know, concrete set of tools, um, I actually would use something that we integrated into the Moving Toward Equity uh, Manager module, if I remember correctly. And it's a technique called SOAR. And it stands for stop, observe, ask questions, and reimagine together, right? And so I think that coming in as a new person to this industry, but also having come from um, the ballet industry, which is very steeped in historical context and significance, um, I have this appreciation for you know, understanding how things have been done and how weighty that is and how important that is, but having to marry that with innovation, right? With thinking about things in a different way, opening things up um, to new ways of doing things, new voices, new, new identities. Um, it's hard, right? There's a lot of push and pull there. And so if we all stop and we observe what's happening. You know, if we see what we've been doing and you know the value of that, but also the value of innovation and new voices, et cetera, um, you know, we see those two things side by side, but then we have to ask questions, right? We have to ask questions about how the two can work together. Um, the ways that we bring some of the old and marry it with the new, uh, to make it even stronger. But then we also have to join together, right? Join forces, right? And this is the, the you know, inclusion part too, is to reimagine it together, right? Make sure that we're um, inviting all the voices that we need at a table to have more perspectives there, right? To, to give ideas that come from different points of view. And then we can reimagine how we do this together. And even just by engaging in that process, you're creating a more inclusive um, you know, community, a more inclusive environment, because you are asking everyone, no matter where they come from, to share what they think will make you know, the, the future of publishing better, stronger, right? More able to connect with a broader, audience of readers. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, I think we can go ahead and open it up for questions. Do we have questions coming in on the chat? We don't yet. Uh, so for people in the audience, if you'd like to ask a question, please use the interact button that you'll see at the bottom of your screen. You could put a question in there for Kim and Tina. And meanwhile, do we have any questions in the audience here? Uh, 
<laughs> Any. Uh, thank you so much for doing this again. It's such a wonderful presentation. Um, and Ms. Tina, congratulations on the job. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I noticed um, probably because um, we are all, you know, very voracious readers, your, your use of language in saying that you wanted to start with inclusion and then you called your modules moving towards equity. And um, you also talked about how, you know, obviously all of these are interconnected, but I wondered how um, you thought of diversity within that language model. Yeah, so um, thank you for your question. And um, I will actually, talk a little bit, if it's okay, about our strategic plan. Um, as please do, please. <laughs> another thing that we did in these last 10 months, um, we have what's called a DEI task force that's made up of what is called our U.S. board. It's our senior management team, but then also our DEI council, which has a representative from each one of our divisions. Um, who comes together with the board and does all manner of things. But one of the biggest achievements this year is creating a 2022 to 2024 strategic plan. I'm actually going to share one more slide, folks, <laughs> and I promise that'll be it. Because I think that's okay. the way for me to, um, uh, to show this and to, uh, okay, is that up? Yep. Excellent. So we have five pillars, five DEI pillars that you'll see here. Um, I'm going to cut to the chase and go to the one that you see that says diversity and representation. So what we did in our task force was to have working groups that correspond to each one of these pillars. Um, and so in our diversity and representation pillar, we are focusing on our hiring efforts our demographics, right? Where we go in terms of our goals, um, where we are going to end up. And so what we've done in terms of hiring, I mean, we're, we're looking at every aspect, you know, the way that we recruit, the questions we ask during our interview process, um, even the standardization of our interview process, meaning that you know, before we start to interview candidates, each candidate, we, you know, we aspire to have each candidate go through exactly the same process. So there's no bias that can seep in to say, oh, this person has to do an extra step or this person can do one fewer steps or, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, but in terms of our demographics, we are aiming by 2024 to have our new higher demographics look like the US census numbers for our working age population, right? That's our first step. And then down the line, we have other goals that correspond to our overall demographics, but hiring is really the key to get us there. And as you can imagine, right, moving the needle on our overall numbers takes time. Whereas with hiring, this is something we can do rather quickly. And in fact, we will be releasing our workforce demographics I guess this will be the third year in a row um, next month. And so you'll be able to see how we've been doing, how we've been progressing over these years. Um, and so we absolutely are focusing on um, our diversity effort, but because we've laid this groundwork and because we are creating this, you know, ever more inclusive community, I feel confident that when we reach that goal, um, anyone and everyone who comes to join us, no matter what you know, demographic they come from, what dimension of identity they represent, um, they will find a place at Penguin Random House. And they will not only find that place, but find a way for themselves to, to thrive, right? And continue on their professional trajectory um, upward, um, ever upward. So I hope that that at least begins to answer your question. Um, in our Thank you, Kim. I hope you'll keep up with what we're putting out there into the world on that front. Other questions? 
This is Pooja. I'm fielding a question from our online participants. This is a question from Michelle Peel, who wanted clarification on the acrostic for SOAR, S-O-A-R. Yes. So unfortunately, I don't have a slide for that. I wish I did now, but um, basically it is um, stop, observe, ask questions, and then reimagine together. Um, that is the, the acronym. And, you know, it's just a way for us to be introspective, right? To stop and observe, but also work collaboratively, right? And inclusively, because we're also asking questions. And then the mandate is to reimagine whatever it is that you're stopping to observe together, right? Meaning bringing voices to the table um, in a way that is as inclusive as possible. Um, I hope that that, that helps. Thank you, Kim. We have another question from our in-person audience, uh, one of our professors, Dean Smith. Thanks, Kim, for sharing your inspiration. That was really fantastic. And uh, my pleasure, my pleasure. I like this idea of making D DEI part of our DNA and would actually make a pretty good book of what you've laid out. But um, I'm curious about what challenges you may have encountered along the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, it is an age old challenge that I think is the biggest one for me. And that is getting everyone on board. You know, for me, you know, it's important that it start at the top. And as I was saying earlier, I felt like that had been completely taken care of at the Penguin Random House. Um, my boss, um, our US CEO, Madeline McIntosh, she is, you know, without a doubt, I could tell from the moment I first started talking to her, she is completely on board um, and fully committed. And um, even just with the creation of my position, right, that is very clear. Um, but you always have this, you know, what I like to call the, you know, the, the middle ground, right? People who tend to know that there's something good in this work, right? They want to do it, but they either don't know how or don't understand how they connect vis-a-vis -vis the effort. Um, and so sometimes that tends to make people just stand in place, right? Um, and then I'd say, you know, if you, you have that, that middle ground, then you also have people who may be resistant, right? And so the biggest challenge is figuring out how to speak to a community that has, you know, leadership, super committed, a whole large infrastructure, very committed. But then, you know, as you go down the spectrum, people who are not really so sure, and then even people who are saying, I, I don't understand why we're doing this. And, you know, I'll say some people even go so far as to say that it's all politics and we shouldn't be talking about politics at work. Right. Um, and so that's where um, this training came into play, like trying to speak to everyone across the entire organization. Um, that was really challenging. Um, and so I tried to meet the challenge with a couple of things. One was opening up this DEI feedback forum and sounding like a broken record to say, I truly want your feedback. And in fact, asking people to engage with the content of the training, but also the programming that's going on at large in the DEI realm, even if you don't think it's for you, so that you can critique it, right? Tell me why it's not for you. Tell me why you think it's political and not, you know, based in the experience, right, of your colleagues. Tell me why. Um, and so those are the kinds of conversations that are equal parts challenging, but also I think equal parts, you know, the, the key to our progress. Um, and so the forum, absolutely. And then I tr we tried to pilot, and Tina, I don't know if you got to listen to it, but we were trying to pilot a podcast <laughs> within our community. 
It's called shared narratives. Um, yeah, I heard about that. I did. Well, I'm going to send you the link because I want you Thank to listen you. before we come out with our next our next episode. But it's a way to just talk about identity and how identity shows up at work. Um, because really DEI work is the work of the people. It's for everyone to do. I can't do it all. You know, I can try to set a strategy or, you know, give some pathways or help encourage people and help support people, but it's really for each and every one of us to do. Um, so yeah, therein lies the challenge, right? Speaking to everyone and, um, finding a way to help everyone connect to this work because without everyone, we, we can't do it. We can't progress to DEI and the DNA. We can't progress to a truly inclusive environment um, unless everyone is in the conversation. Thank you, Kim. Uh, Pooja, I think you have a question. Yes, again, I'm fielding a question from our online participants. This is a question from Ryan Kendall. Thank you for this great presentation, Kim. Since you came to publishing without experience, I'm wondering if you could speak to what sort of mentoring you had or wish you had when you started. How can we better practice DEI ethics in mentoring people of color who are just getting started in publishing? Yeah, oh, that's a great question. Great question. Um, you know, I had mentors of all kinds um, and I'm still being mentored right? Every day. I'm a consummate student, you know, a, a, a forever student, however you want to label it. Um, so I have relied on, um, of course, my colleagues, right? Everyone was, was very welcoming and open, but I also have been um, talking to my counterparts and other publishing professionals in other publishing houses who have helped me to just understand the landscape at large. Um, I have tapped into resources like AAP. You know, I've spoken to many of the professionals there so that I can get a sense of the industry itself um, from a, you know, a trade association context. Um, I have talked to so many of my colleagues at all levels of, of the organization. You know, I mean, that that really has been the key. And um, I am, you know, constantly in that ask questions phase, right? If we're going to go back to SOAR, um, because curiosity is the only way that I'm going to, you know, build my, this muscle, right, of learning more and more about the publishing industry. Um, I love to see programs like the one that John mentioned, um, you know, the certificate programs, because I think that is, um, that's a key to helping open up this industry, um, giving, you know, especially to aspiring professionals, some sense of what they need, the tools that they need, but also some of the knowledge that they need before they even go into figuring out what aspect of publishing they'd like to broach. Um, but really it's, you know, it's about networking, having conversations and having people that you can trust um, to ask questions whenever they come up. Um, I know that's a really amorphous answer, but, um, you know, it, it is what I'm doing. It is the, the, the truth. Um, it is in addition to reading and going to webinars and conferences and things like that, but I think that um, the most important, like at the heart of it, is um, connecting, right? Connecting with people who are willing to, to answer your questions and um, open up their worlds, right? And their experience to you. Thank you, Kim. We have another question from our in-person audience. Kim, hi, my name is John Scherer. I work at the University of North Carolina Press. Um, thank you very much for your presentation today, and I just want to acknowledge that it's super meaningful that um, Penguin Random House created your position and is a leader in the publishing industry. What you all do matters. I also want to acknowledge you taking an hour out of your day um, to join us, which is a very generous thing to do. And, uh, okay, thank you. My, truly my pleasure, truly. Okay, so now I'm going to ask you for some free advice since you're here. <laughs> so if my organization is one one hundredth the size of yours, and I will not be able to create a position like yours um, at my organization. 
the thing we have really wrestled with is making progress um, and determining whether progress should be generated by leadership or in a more organic way, where a lot of, frankly, a lot of the enthusiasm is, but maybe not the skills to, to, to make change happen and also the sense of empowerment. So I'm just wondering if you have any sense for a much smaller organization mm -hmm. about how do you balance the enthusiasm of a younger generation um, and, and make them feel empowered, but also acknowledging that leadership has to play a role. Frankly, I struggle if it, it's perceived as something coming from me. Sometimes it's a reflexive reaction, like this is just what, you know, John, you, you can't see me, but I'm a white guy at 6'2", and so, like, I'm, I may not be a perceived leader in this in this work, despite what I say. So I'm just kind of curious about how to, how to manage that balance. We have 50 people in our organization, so that's what I'm thinking about. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's a, you know, a common challenge as well. Um, I will say, you know, even in just looking at how you um, set a foundation for this work at large, one of the first things you need to do is get a sense of the status quo. So absolutely call on, you know, the entire organization if you can, if you can do a survey of some kind or, you know, something to just get a sense of what the issues are that are at the forefront for your community. Um, and then once you, I'm sure that you will uncover some themes. And then once you do that, then I think you, um, you ask for volunteers, right? You don't want it to be only leadership, right? Leadership can, can and should be involved and can and should resource these efforts. But I think that, you know, allowing people to say, these are the issues that are at the forefront for us. And then maybe you can say, I don't, you know, I don't know if you have the ability to resource like employee resource groups, right? And allow them to come together around these issues um, and then join forces with your leadership in order to actually create action, right? Out of the themes that you've identified. Um, but yes, you know, you, you have to rely on, um, kind of community based sentiment, I think, um, to start this work in a way that addresses what you need to do to become a more inclusive organization, because there is no one size fits all, you know, I can tell you what we're doing at Penguin Random House, but that really has no bearing on what your organization might need. So you need to hear it from the source. Um, I do think that ERGs are a great and powerful way to begin your work. Um, and I don't know, Tina, if you're involved in any of our ERGs, but many <coughs> of the ideas for um, programming that are, you know, are generated from that, uh, that context. Um, so truly in the ERG context, you might be able to figure out the foundations of an overarching DEI strategy, right? Um, but start with that status quo, you know, start by, by asking again, like back to, to ask questions, um, but then make yourselves as leaders available and accessible to address um, any themes that you see rise to the top. Thank you, Kim. Um, can I have Kuja? One more question from our online community. This is a truly impressive and admirable DEI initiative, and I'm curious how visible it is to other publishing houses in the industry and to the general public. It just makes me wonder if PRH's status as one of the largest trade publishers, if not the largest, could be leveraged to inspire similar initiatives in the other major publishing houses like Hachette, HarperCollins, Simon & Schuster. Yeah, I don't know how visible it is. Um, you know, there are certain things that we have released publicly. Um, for instance, the workforce demographics that I mentioned, and we'll be doing that again in November. And I do know that that has inspired some of the other publishing houses to do the same. Um, I think that we were the first to be so transparent about our workforce demographics. Um, and so, you know, I do hope that at a certain point, and I, you know, I, I still 
really feel strongly about this inclusion first thing that we're doing work to make sure that we as a community are ready. Um, and until then, I don't, I don't know how comfortable I feel saying, look at us, look at what we're doing, you know, <laughs> because I don't want, I don't want anyone to think that we're patting ourselves on the back. Like that is not it at all. Right. We're just continuing to move along a journey that frankly will never end. Right. Because it just evolves. Um, so maybe there will be a point in time where it makes sense for us to start talking about what we've done. Um, for instance, at the end of having these conversations, these equity and action conversations, I'm going to be really excited to tell our community how many conversations we've been able to have about equity, right? I mean, that is something that I don't think is common. Um, I'm not, not even just in the publishing industry, right? Just in corporate America. And so maybe that will be a moment for us to say, this is what we're doing, but it also allows us to illustrate that what it means, like having these conversations just means that now we know what work we have to do, right? So it's not about patting ourselves on the back. It's about like figuring out what we need to do and then putting the steps in place that will get us there, right? Moving toward equity. Um, so, you know, maybe there will be an opportunity, but I'm very careful about that, right? Because the work is never done and it is always evolving. Um, and so, you know, I think that maybe there's a way, but it has to be done with great, great care. But I thank you for your, you know, your faith in us, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> your faith that we can help to, to potentially influence. Um, and I hope that one day, you know, the industry will be a leader in and of itself, right? Leading other parts of corporate America to do what we do. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, do we have any more questions? Or Do we have one more question from the audience? Anybody? I guess, uh, well, let's thank Tina and Kim for a wonderful plenary. Thank you, Kim. And thank you, Tina. Such a pleasure. We're going to be back at the end of the day. She's our, our double hitter today. So. <laughs> um, so thank you so much, Kim, for joining us. And, and thank you, Tina, for moderating this great conversation. Of course. Thank, thank you so much, Kim. It's, I just want to say again how overjoyed I am to have you at Penguin Random House. It's just it's, it's great that you're with us, and I'm really, really happy you were able to come to the conference. Thank you so much. And thank you, Tina. This was fabulous, and I'm really honored to have been here and um, looking forward to more conversation. Take care, everyone, and enjoy the conference. Thank you. <laughs>